coming up on Theater Talk. Okay, moms. <laughs> of all the money well, that better. air I had, I lost it in good company, ladies. And of all the harm that air I had done, alas, was done to none but me. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. I've been better for years. It's why I'm comfortable talking about it. You take medicine for that? Dad, that's rude to ask. It's all right. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, in our family, we don't, um, we don't have that kind of depression. Yeah, no, we just have a lot of stoic sadness. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, there is a terrific new American, I'm happy to say, play here in New York on Broadway called The Humans, really uh, the most exciting uh, American drama I've seen since uh, August Osage County, I'd have to say. Uh, it was written by a newcomer to the scene, Stephen Karam. Welcome to Theater Talk. And it has an absolutely superb cast. And as I told them before we start, it's the kind of acting where you do not see the acting. You see real people, not actors. Welcome to Theater Talk, Jane Howdyshell. Thank you. It's good to be back. Reed Bernie, I think it's your first time on Theater It is my very first time. Well, yeah. welcome to our show. So Jane here. is our veteran. Yeah. She's, She's our veteran. She's she was our here for her Tony-nominated role in Well, Lisa Crone's Well. Brilliant, yes. And also another first-timer of Theater Talk newbie, Cassie Beck, another Hello. terrific, terrific cast member of The Humans at the Helen Hayes. Welcome all. Thank uh, you. All right, Stephen, so can you just take us back to the moment where you suddenly begin to conceive of this slightly, shall we say, dysfunctional American family that's at the center of your play? It was a long and winding road. I didn't start out thinking I was going to write a family drama. Uh, I was thinking a lot about fear and anxiety post 9-11, post financial crisis, and uh, I was looking for a story that would let me talk about those things via um, hopefully a play that would be a little scary itself or fear inducing. So I actually thought I was going to be writing something um, very genre, like a stage thriller. Death Trap became the humans in a way. Uh, yeah, and the more I uh, fell in love with these characters and started to think about um, the specific existential horrors that were plaguing this particular group of people and you know, really everyone, fear of death, fear of losing the love of someone, fear of poverty, fear, fear of, of Ill health, yeah. illness, you know, it took the shape of a real-time play um, that would let me sort of look at the horrors of everyday life in, the, in these sort of quiet moments. And squarely, though, in the tradition of the, of the American family drama, I mean, we think of Long Day's Journey and Tonight, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? You know, these are domestic plays with existential themes going on, very much like, I think, The Humans. Sure. I okay. guess what I'm saying is I, I ended up with uh, a family play that was sort of infected by the thriller genre. It's sort of like a, a genre collision play. You have... Uh, the family who's on the edge between the humor and comfort of a family gathering and every crisis that you can imagine. When did it get to the play that there was such humor in it? I think people are um, resilient and hilarious in the face of, you know, um, of, of all of their uh, anxieties and, and crises. And so it's just, I think it's part of it's just my worldview. Um, and I love to go to the theater and to laugh. Yeah. Now, I want to go through each of the, the characters you play. Um, Jane, if you can give us a sense of, um, you're, you're the mother of this family. Yes. A sense of who she is and where she is at this particular point when this play begins. I think she's a really good mom, and she's uh, been a devoted mother her entire adult life. I mean, she married, I think, young, right. and they started their family pretty soon after that. Um, but she's also um, a working mom, mm -hmm. so, and uh, she's a woman who's learned how to cope with a lot of pressure from a lot of different angles uh, throughout her life, and she's caring for her husband's mother now, who is aging and um, really a handful, uh, in addition to everything else. But uh, it's kind of the central thing that holds her together, 
with all the kind of stressors that she has uh, is her faith, which is yeah. abiding and deep, yeah. and she's a very devoted Catholic. What I like about the play, we have sort of smart alecky stuff where people are uh, sneering a little bit at faith, but it's, it's the Catholicism of this family that uh, keeps them from maybe destroying each other and perhaps destroying themselves in some way. The kind of faith we grew up with, it's not perfect, but you take for granted what a, a, a kind of natural antidepressant it is. No religion at the table. Uh, my mouth is shut. I think our faith is unshakable, and even in the crisis of uh, um, our marriage, our impulse is to go to the church for counseling. Mm -hmm. Um, would never occur to us to go to a marriage counselor. No, when you have when you have a, a rift in the relationship, you talk about going to see the the priest. Father I Quinn. mean, it's a very traditional yeah. old family. And I don't imagine what Father Quinn says to us is particularly <laughs> right. uh, incisive. Forgive each other. Right. Love each other. Stay together. Stay together. Say some hail marys or novenas, and and you're going to be fine. Right. What I am sneering at is therapy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, what's that all about, right. going to therapy and having somebody know your business and tell you what to do? And yet the faith seems to be, and you, by it hits your generation, it brings you together, but it's sort of pulling you away from, from the, your parents. That's right. Yeah. I have issues with Father Quinn. <laughs> uh, I think for Amy, who I, the character that I play, the, Our old, daughter. Daughter, the, yeah. daughter, yeah. the daughter, the older sibling, Every time Father Quinn comes up, I'm a little, ooh, okay. Um, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> right, I remember Father Quinn. Um, but my, my role, I think, in the family dynamic is I'm the mediator, I'm the peacemaker. Um, Amy uses humor to deflect tension mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, she's a lot like her dad. I mm -hmm. think she's got a lot of pride. She's private. Um, she wants to handle things in that kind of, you know, salt of the earth American way of I'm going to pull myself through it and... I don't think she dwells. Mm -hmm. um, I can't relate to her in that, in that respect. I'm a dweller and a fretter. But what I love <laughs> about Amy is that she's in the moment and moving forward. Well, she always. does some fretting up there. Well, On I the telephone? I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's more also, though, about um, Amy's inability to completely accept that she's oh, right. in a, in a relationship that's over. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So she's still reaching for something. Well, in some ways, and it's that oh. spirituality. I mean, it's the younger generation who, you know, you guys, the, the daughters don't have this faith that their yeah. parents have this unshakable faith. But There's no I feel like they are reaching out in their own ways for to fill that void via um, you make fun of uh, uh the youngest daughter for therapy and superfoods and you're doing hot yoga and juice <laughs> cleansing, right, right, but you right, won't right. sit in a church pew and say a prayer. Yeah. You yeah. think that's, you know, you'll meditate, but you won't you know, you think I'm crazy for saying a Hail Mary. Um, I think in some ways, uh, you know, your ex-girlfriend was maybe your religion in a certain way. You know what yeah, I mean? Which is why work, in these I moments, think. it's reaching out to this woman who um, we're Amy's connected to for it, you know. Yeah. There's an interesting dynamic in this play, and among all the characters here, that they are a close family, but you have these intensely private moments each of them has even though they're in the apartment together to celebrate thanksgiving it's a family moment there are moments when each one of you sort of steps away mm -hmm. and we see your own fears that you may not even be able to share with everybody else yeah. is that a fair assessment yes. of what's going on in this mm -hmm. in yes. this event and that's my life experience of every family gathering i've ever been to <laughs> i mean that you know you 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 do you come together it's intense and and uh, you're close and or whatever and you're interacting and then all of a sudden people drift off to the kitchen or drift off to the the bar the bedroom or <laughs> yeah. whatever you, yeah. because you you can't you need to remove yourself from the intensity in certain ways and we do all find a way to do that in this yeah. tiny apartment mm -hmm. it's interesting I almost took, I mean, I literally took away cell service in the, the lower basement level. Um, and still, you know, Amy escapes upstairs, you know, the, the one window that where they can get like a few bars. Yeah. But. The other interesting thing about this play uh, is we think of New York City now as this incredibly glamorous, rich place. And people like me from Scranton and their daughter who's moved to New York, who does not live in a nice apartment, you're seeing a, a side of um, the economics of New York for people that New York is really not for these people. Mm -mm. You cannot afford to be here. And I think a friend it's of mine a saw, it, apartment. saw it the very early in previews, maybe the second or third preview, and he said, 
I'm so stunned to see a play that addresses how hard it is to be poor in America. Like he had never seen that before. And, uh, I, I think back, it's true. It's like it, it's, there's really aren't, people don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And what I love is then you put in one character who has access to wealth. Yeah. He's not, it, it's the son-in-law. And that's such a smart device you've put in to set things in perspective. You know, he's had his problems too, but then he says, but I'm going to get my trust fund in a couple of years. And you realize that that's yeah. not. <laughs> when he says people. trust fund, the sympathy for him goes out the window. <laughs> no, but that, 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 really for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Right, right. You clearly did that in a very clever way. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I was interested in that dynamic, but what that inserts into the discussion. But I also wanted him to be someone, you know, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the, how, how someone like, the character of Richard maybe um, has a kind of awareness of he's very loving towards the family and is very much trying to. And we should say he's dating your sister, your other daughter. Right. He's so dating the youngest he's not daughter. A member. Yeah, and he's you know a bit older. He's about ten years older, which is not you know. But your not married, thing in the world. as Jane points out. That's not right. Like, he's yeah. not is the brother or the son-in-law right. until right. they get married. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but that, that brings up its own anxiety. So I was not trying to paint him as the, let's say, the, the typical, like, uh, uh, spoiled trust rich, fund yeah. spoiled. Yeah, I try, I, you know. No, but it's just even then, it's no way out for anybody else. No totally. way out. And then, but suddenly, and then you go, oh, well, money is a, is a big help here that they don't have. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. And how easy it is to take it for granted yes. how many problems money can solve. I find, too, uh, in, in your character, because uh, I've seen this happen with families that I grew up in. You, you seem to be the first of this family who's gone to college. You're a lawyer. That's the, right. You know, your parents are working class people. Right. So you already are moving in a new socioeconomic environment. You have your own particular struggles with the job at this point. Right. But you are moving away a bit from this world that you grew up in of a bit bleak. It's funny. When people see the play, the first thing they say to me sometimes out in the lobby is, Are you going to sue? <laughs> are you gonna, you know, are you gonna fix the problems? You're, you know, Amy's gonna fix. Amy's gonna make money, and she's gonna fix everything. And uh, uh, I think, like Richard's character, you know, the the idea is who's gonna be the one to fix this, right? Um, without trying to give too much away. And I, I think for Amy though, it's just it just speaks to her personality. I think she's a workhorse. I think she puts her. I think she got that from her parents. It's, it was our dream that our kids do better, yeah. right. like everybody's. Right. You know, your kids are not going to have the same struggles. But the paradox about that is that they then have no real sense of what it is we went through. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, that's true, I think, yeah. of first-generation families <clears throat> into the next generation. The people who came, I mean, our parents came off the boat. Right. from Ireland. So, you know, we watched them struggle and we got to our middle class status through working very, very hard so our daughters can have something better. But we're also perplexed by what that better is, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. It's a little confusing because <laughs> both of our girls did go to college, but one is becoming an artist. We well, don't, you know, that's maybe. baffling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. that's baffling. <laughs> No, I mean, her difficulties of being an artist problem are sort of you, you seem absurd compared right. with, I don't know if you intended that, compared with the other problems. The problems the parents have. have. Yeah. <laughs> sure, well, but I, I'm, I, I think it's amazing how, um, you know, you're talking about these private moments and how, how connected a family uh, can be. And this is, I think, a very tight-knit, uh, oh, loving family, but how disconnected they can be from each other's problems at the same time. So there really is a kind of disconnect just how um, brutal and um, tough it's been for the two of them, you know, to take care of, uh, you know, Bridget, the younger daughter's grandmother. Um, and she's just kind of like, you know, why don't you get a Manny Petty and, and uh, right. you'll feel better, Mom. It's like there's a kind of, yeah. <laughs> and then she, doesn't, she doesn't quite understand you, what's going you've on. You've hidden sure. in a, a built-in secret problem which is, you know, a very difficult secret problem, which we have to get to, and that that right. makes the play so much more powerful that there's even problems that can't be talked about. And, and, and yet at the same time, what I hope is kind of wonderfully strange about that secret is because everyone expects a secret in the family play is that right. it's actually, it has been to some degree, not to bring back Father Quinn, but... <laughs> Talked Actually, about and resolved. Yeah, Meaning I feel right. like without giving away the secret, right. I feel like the maybe the the play people might expect is the one right. where 
Jane's character finds out the secret in right. real time right, at right, the right. That's and where everyone has the <gasps> yeah. and so it's the strangeness right. but they're of working, like they're working we on the problem. About, we're okay. Yeah. I say it's, more than once, we're good, right. and I think so we I are. I don't believe you. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to be easy. You but say we're good, and I don't believe you. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Goody Haskins, Goody Haskins no, over here. No, She'd be like, you dump him. Get out. <laughs> no, <laughs> Missing the point of the place is that they love you, each other. No, no, no. It's, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about that it's, it's good in your conscience. I'm talking about then, in the, in the staging by Joe Mantello, things happen. Things happen in the play that I, I don't feel that you are necessarily going into a world because of the way the director has put this play. It doesn't look happy. Th disagree. You're, feel free to disagree. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? I yeah. do see what you're saying, but I actually think the point of the play, again, we have to be so obtuse here in, in <laughs> how we talk about it, because uh, we want you to come see it. <laughs> and it's a good reveal. It is yeah. a good reveal. It's a great uh, reveal. Um, is that... It's not going to be easy, but we endure. All right. Yes. We endure. Because the humans right. endure. Because you could be, you could be uh, killed by the monster neighbor. I mean, this is why it's great art, because there is great ambiguity about some aspects, and, which and, is very fascinating. And engenders fantastic discussions post-show. I'll bet. Uh, right. Which is thrilling for and all of us. One of the things that's extraordinary about this ending is there is no denouement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's not... It's not traditional in any way, this play, in a way, mm -hmm. even though on the page it looks quite, um, what's the word? Genre, yeah, it's yeah. a family drama. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. But it doesn't spin out that way. Since you're all um, established and very successful people in the theater, I'd love to get a sense of your, uh, of your backgrounds. Uh, so, Stephen, can you tell me, what was, as a kid growing up, what was the first play theatrical experience that you thought boy this is oh a world gosh. i want to work in i saw my sister's production of uh, little shop of horrors at north scranton intermediate school yes um, <laughs> i was in first grade she was one of like they i remember they because i was my first introduction to the show she was one of like a hundred uh, Duop girls instead of <laughs> crystal runnette and chiffon <laughs> she was she everyone has to have a part <laughs> So the way they made that, <laughs> there was like, you know, all of these crazy supernumeraries in, in their, this production of, of Little Shop. So she, she was, uh, uh, and I was just kind of blown away. I didn't even know, um, I didn't even know what theater was. So it wasn't like I, I had this gradual reveal. And then I went home, I remember my parents rented the movie because, you know, she was excited about being in the play. And I kind of just, I devoured a lot of plays in school. Like I remember reading, uh, just every author was a discovery. Tennessee Williams, The Glass Menagerie, The Crucible. It was the classic, um, you know, reading August Wilson. It's the classic high school reading list. And, um, and you knew you wanted to be a writer then? Or did you think maybe an actor, maybe a director? No, I mean, I was imitating. I loved writing, so I was, I was acting in plays, and I was um, uh, a very nervous actor. So I, I kind of sensed that that probably wasn't going to be... But I wanted to be a part of the theater. So I was, yeah, I just started imitating any kind of... Um, a new play I would discover. I would I would read a David Mamet play. I would write like David Mamet. I would <laughs> discover Carol Churchill. I would try to write like her. I um, and then I discovered the drama bookshop. And my my mom would take me sort of my annual birthday Christmas present was to come. Do you remember when it used to be above? Yeah, like it was on Forty Seventh Street above above like a, 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 a across from the bar. Right? Yeah, across from the pa <laughs> it was across from the Palace Theater. And you'd go upstairs. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. really creaky and right. grimy yeah, 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 and old yeah. and, and fabulous. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. And, yeah. and so I would go and kind of blindly pick out you know five or six plays. And so my love of theater really did come from a lot of reading. Um, and then the school trips that we we saw uh, you know before college were big, big shows like everybody. You know, mm -hmm. my first Broadway show was Phantom. Mm -hmm. Um, still there across the street. From still across the street, which is actually a really, you know, <laughs> does have like special back, meaning. All right, going back uh, uh, before Phantom Reed for you, yeah. wh where'd you grow up? I grew up in Delaware, so, so it's not too similar far. idea, yeah. And for you, what was the early, in your life? Where I remember it? being about five, yeah. and I think I went to see Wonders of Aladdin with Donald O'Connor at the little movie theater in town that had 35 seats, and, uh, and, and getting oh, you can do that, that's for me. And saying to a group of grown-ups, I wanted to be an actor, and they were all, <laughs> you know that. Uh, and uh, I just steered my life in that direction forever. Um, my first Broadway play was Gemini in the same theater where right, I am now. Albert Inarato. Uh, Albert Inarato, and uh, I was 22 
uh, and I was not prepared for how intense it was going to be for me 39 years later to come back into yeah. this theater mm -hmm. and um, have this experience having had that for a year and a half. Mm. Yeah, it was, uh, if you saw it in a movie, you'd say it's a little on the nose. It's a little heavy handed. You can't go back to the exact same theater. Are you in the same dressing room as you were back then? I tried. Uh, the understudies are in there now. I don't know what that's about. Uh, <laughs> you, you've gone up a little in the world uh, at the star yeah, dressing room. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, a lot of ghosts at the Helen Hayes Theater for me. Yeah, and um, Cassie, uh, you're, where'd you grow up? Well, I'm a military brat, so oh. I, I didn't grow up in one place, America. I grew up in America, <laughs> uh, all over. Um, when I was seven, my mom took me to the Redlands Bowl, which is where we were in Southern California at the time, and I saw the Music Man, and that was it. I was hooked. But I grew up as a dancer, actually, so um, a lot of my training, performative training, was dance. And then in high school, I, I moved into theater. I kind of came late to the game, but... Um, there is a small jig moment. Yes, in, I love it. In the it's humans. My, yeah. She made the mistake <laughs> of telling And I made the mistake me. of telling Stephen Karam that she... I am an ex Irish dance champion. Oh, <laughs> which is true. There we go. No, no, don't move the arms. <laughs> <laughs> which is true. And um, he wrote it in. <laughs> yeah. It's in the book. I don't know if it's written in. Is it written in now? It's 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 it's, it's, it's written into our production. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you're welcome, actors to come. To play me. Um, that that came from a from my real life. I was joking about it, and I remember Joe snuck up to me one day uh, in tech and said, "Stephen wants you to put in the jig." <laughs> and I was like, "Nah, -uh, really?" And he goes, "Yeah, he wants you to do it." Do you get points for that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you get a royalty from him? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> you know, I wrote the whole part for with Cassie in mind before I had even I just seen her in about four or five off Broadway shows. Oh, really? And you know, you always have actors in your head before mm -hmm. you, and I was just like. Yeah, this is this is going to be for Cassie. Of course, and didn't even, you know didn't even know she'd be able to do the reading. She did the reading, and she stuck with the play. From it was one of those magical things that it actually worked out that way. That you know. The first time I read the play, I thought, oh please God, just let me be a part of this in some way. And I'm so thankful that Stephen didn't tell me that he had me in mind when he wrote it because I didn't find out till later, a couple of readings and workshops later. Because anytime anybody tells you you're perfect for something or that it's for you, you yes, inevitably you're going to yeah. be self conscious. So. <laughs> Yes. And last but not least, of course, Jane, you're, um, where, where, were you, where are you from originally? Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Kansas, right. And growing up as a kid, I mean, what was it for you? Who was passing through town in a touring show? Uh, <laughs> Ethel Merman? Well, <laughs> almost. Um, I, 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 first of all, as a child, I grew up with, with a father who kind of had a dream deferred. He, as a young man, before he married, he had a brief time in doing traveling summer stock in the Midwest and then he went to Kansas City to break into vaudeville and uh, he <laughs> it was short-lived because it was 1929 <laughs> <laughs> right at the end yeah. <laughs> right at the uh, timing. <laughs> but anyway he had a performer's instinct and yeah. uh, and that was never indulged so as a child I grew up watching him do magic tricks and I watched him play the ukulele and sing, and we all sang together as a family. He was in a barbershop group, so we all sang in four-part harmony. There were four girls <laughs> and all of that. So it was naturally in our house somehow, mm -hmm. but um, seeing shows and that sort of thing, it was, you know, that because we were in a rural community, I didn't see theater, but I'd listen to cast albums right. until the grooves were worn off the right. record. And I knew them all back to front and performed them constantly and um, but when I got into high school I was lucky enough to have one of those drama teachers that was incredible so gifted so dedicated and recognized that I was avid and so she gave me an enormous amount of uh, opportunity to do a wide range of roles and by my junior year I was uh, practically doing nothing but independent studies with specialized things in theater it was really an extraordinary high school experience so and she was the one who made sure that I got into an acting school uh, when I left um, high school and uh, yeah, so I w had some legs up. Did your early dad live on. long enough to see you uh, attain some? He saw me success? do summer stock in the Midwest. He saw me do um, a lot of musicals. I did a lot of musicals when I was uh, in my twenties before I moved to New York. And yes, he was very proud. 
Excellent. <laughs> Before we wrap it up, I just want to say that you're an ensemble, and I want to mention the other three actors who aren't here. Thank you. Sarah Steele. Lauren Klein. And Arian Moore. Arian Moore. And Lauren Klein plays the mother with dementia, and she has practically no lines, and she She's is, incredible. I mean, the others are great too, but I'm going to say kudos to her. Lying on a couch. And the stuff she says, the gibberish she says, is all written down. Yes, she's I, learned it syllable by syllable. I got the script, and it says yeah. really good. She, do, yeah. right. she yeah. does it. She's she's incredible. She disappears into the part. Yeah, in yeah. A way. yeah. It's, it's a terrific play. The Humans by Stephen Karam, uh, starring Jane Howdyshell, Reed Burney, and Cassie Beck. Uh, don't miss it at the Helen Hayes Theater. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk, and good luck with the success of this play. Thank, Thank you. you. See you all at the. Dare I say it? Tony Awards. <laughs> <laughs> don't miss it. Don't miss it. So you said half your friends are in therapy. You said that's that, so I'm because, just asking. Yeah, I was trying to get you to pay for mine. I still can't afford it. Well, save some of the money you spend on organic juice and pay for it yourself. Don't criticize me for caring about my mental health, okay? What about Rich's mom is a therapist? Uh, why don't you get it from her? Yeah, Dad, I'll get therapy from my mother-in-law. That's an awesome idea. Not your mother-in-law unless you get married. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.